If you're here in church and it's June the 7th, then great. If you're not in church and it's just me and Ron and Martha again, then that's great too. I'm just glad you're listening. But uh, since I'm late on everything, <clears throat> uh, as I told you last week, I was late on uh, Memorial Day and now I'm late on Pentecost, uh, but uh, having Pentecost on June the 7th instead of May 31st or as the government says it's on May 25th. Anyway, how about a good Lenten sermon since we're not in Lent anymore? An Irishman walks into a bar in Dublin, orders three pints of Guinness and sits in the back of the room drinking a sip out of each one in turn. When he finishes them, he comes back to the bar and orders three more. The bartender asks him, you know, a pint goes flat after I draw it. Wouldn't you rather I draw fresh pints for you one at a time? And the fellow replies, well, you see, I have two brothers. One is now in America and the other in Australia. And when we all left home, we promised we'd drink this way to remember the days when we drank together. The bartender admits that this is a nice custom and he leaves it there. So the fellow becomes a regular in the bar and always drinks the same way. Orders three pints, drinks them in turn. And then one day, he comes in and he orders two pints. All the regulars notice and kind of fall silent, speculating about what might have happened to one of the absent brothers. When the fellow goes back to the bar for a second round, the bartender says, I don't want to intrude on your grief, but I wanted to offer my condolences on your great loss. The fellow looks confused for a moment, and then a light dawns in his eye, and he laughs, and he says, Oh, no, everybody's fine. You see, it's just that I've given up beer for Lent. Now, you can feel free to laugh all you want to. <laughs> oh, man, a good Lenten joke on about, uh, what, two or three weeks, four weeks, too late. Today we're going to be talking about Pentecost. Right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus, we glorify you today for the gift and power of your Holy Spirit. And we praise you for the spectacular outpouring of your Spirit at the first Pentecost and for the launching of your son's church in power, miraculous unity. We thank you, righteous God, for your spirit's might in convicting us of sin again and again. And when we become smug and self-righteous, lazy and callous, holier than thou, we praise you for your, skill, for your spirit's skill in reminding us that all of these things don't work in your kingdom. We give you thanks for the mirror of your spirit in which we see ourselves not as others see us, but far more disturbingly as you see us. We glorify you, God, for your spirit's ministry of comfort. And we pray that friends and loved ones who are ill or bereaved or troubled in any way, for those who have lost loved ones in COVID-19, for those who have lost loved ones any time this year or the years before, Lord, we pray that you would comfort them with your presence, with the presence of your spirit. Help them to find strength and renewal of faith in the witness of your spirit. Dear God, let this day and this service become a personal Pentecost for many of us. Renew the church, beginning with us, and teach us through your spirit how to proclaim the good news of your faithfulness and love in new and effective ways. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we begin today, I want to turn to Acts chapter 2, which all of you know is a traditional passage for Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost came, 
They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. <clears throat> Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then skipping to verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. This is, by the way, this is Peter's first great sermon. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, <clears throat> I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. So that's Pentecost. In May of 2003, at about 6 p.m., on a Saturday evening, a very powerful tornado swept through northeast Missouri, landing in Canton, and then jumping over the Mississippi River and destroying homes and farms in western Illinois. <clears throat> in Canton, Missouri, about 40 homes and trailers were destroyed, and six buildings on the campus of Culver Stockton College were flattened, and many cars and trucks were lifted in the air and dropped several blocks away. The shoppers at the county market grocery store were in a state of panic. But then, a very loud voice comes over the intercom, and it was the voice of the manager of the store. And this is what he said. Don't leave this store or you will die. Your only chance of survival is to do exactly <clears throat> what I tell you. And the manager directed the shoppers to enter their meat locker. And they did just as he said. And all the shoppers survived the tornado. The store building was destroyed and collapsed around them, but the meat locker stood. That manager is still a hero in that community. And also, as a side note, this was the day of Culver Stockton's graduation, which was held that year in the gym and had the tornado come that morning during the ceremony, many lives would have been lost. On April 27th, 2011, the largest tornado outbreak ever recorded in history until that time hit parts of the southern U.S., causing catastrophic destruction in five states, or really six states, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Virginia. 
Four of those tornadoes which swept through the south on that terrible day were destructive enough to be rated EF5 tornadoes, which is the highest ranking possible. EF5 tornadoes are extremely rare, and yet on this day alone, there were four EF5 tornadoes killing an estimated 346 people. Brenda and I were at home, and in, in our home is in Birmingham, Alabama, and we weren't there at that time, but we read about it and heard about it on television. It was horrible. So today, when I read our scripture in Acts, and I read the story of Pentecost, and I got to that verse which said, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I think talking about these tornadoes give us something to compare it with. <laughs> Recently I was reading about a town on the coast of Scotland that was experiencing a particularly heavy gale force wind. And at the height of the gale, the harbor master radioed an officer on the local coastal authority and asked him to estimate the wind speed. The officer replied he was sorry, but he didn't have a gauge. However, if it was any help, he said, the wind had just blown his Land Rover off the cliff. So that must have been a pretty powerful wind. It also reminded me of the two farmers who were boasting about the strongest wind they had ever seen. One said, you know, out here in California, we have these huge redwood trees. And I saw the fiercest wind come through, and the wind went, it blew so strong that it bent those redwoods right down. Oh, that's nothing, <coughs> said the other farmer. Back on my farm in Iowa, we had a terrible wind one day that blew at least 140 miles an hour. And it was so bad, one of my hens had her back turned to the wind, and she laid the same egg six times. Oh, well, all people have stories to tell, don't they? Biblical scholars have written that the wind that came down on the day of Pentecost was likely the most significant wind that has ever blown. Of course, scholars of the Bible are not exactly weather historians, and throughout history there have been some mighty large gale force winds and tsunamis that have swept across our world. However, did you know the translation of the word wind in both our Greek and Hebrew scriptures is also the word for spirit? The word for wind is pneuma in Greek and Hebrew, and it means wind or spirit, or it could even be interpreted as breath. So wind means spirit in the Bible. Powerful, wind-powerful spirit. I will confess that uh, when we talk about Pentecost, uh, it's a time of the church year that requires a great deal of explanation, particularly to non-Christians, but also to longtime faithful church people. I often hear questions like, I get Jesus, he's the Savior, and I think I follow the concept of God, but Holy Spirit, I don't get that one at all. Tongues of fire, speaking in tongues, understanding that speaking in tongues stuff. Why do we need a Holy Spirit? Isn't, isn't faith in God enough? Jesus died on the cross. So what does the Holy Spirit do for us? <laughs> so it helps me as I think about the Holy Spirit to consider that most powerful of all things in nature and compare the Holy Spirit to the wind. <clears throat> what does the Bible teach us? The Bible teaches, and so does science, that the wind is necessary for life. Look at all the wind farms that are being built across the nation. Dr. Donald B. DeYoung notes in his book, Weather in the Bible, wind is moving air. And this fresh air is needed continually for life itself. Seeds require wind for their dispersal and subsequent growth. 
In the same manner, the Holy Spirit is the presence of God, the source for all life. And as I said earlier, we need to realize that the word for wind and spirit is also the same word for breath. From the beginning, air and wind were important for life. In Genesis 2, 7, we read, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into him. And the man became a living being. It is not air that makes us unique among all living creatures. <clears throat> it is the fact that we have God's Spirit within us from the very beginning of time that makes us distinct. Some years ago, as a firefighter, I was required to take a Red Cross first aid course. And at that time, the CPR courses were very primitive. I hadn't got into that a whole lot. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And some of you know today probably more about it than I do. Some of you know the ABC steps of CPR. A, airway open. B, breathing restored, and C, circulation restored, A, B, C. The first two steps are crucial because they get oxygen into the victim's body. Without life-giving oxygen, the person will die. No matter how effective the chest compressions in step C, the rescuer breathes his very breath into the patient's lungs. And this is exactly what happened at Pentecost. Jesus promised his disciples before he left them that the Holy Spirit would come upon them in great power. In essence, he was saying, I will give you the very breath of my life. And on Pentecost, God breathed new life into Christ's disciples. Now, the second thing about the wind is that the wind is unseen. We never see it, but we always feel it. I read of a pastor trying to describe the Holy Spirit in a children's message, and a little girl stole the moment when she stood up and said, God is kind of like a balloon. After it's blown up, it floats and floats around different places, and then if it pops, that air that's in there spreads all over the place. Balloons make us happy. And they spread the joy and love around. Amen. What great truths coming from a small child. The Holy Spirit is a mysterious unseen force of the living God. Its presence is only known by its effects. Without a doubt, with the Holy Spirit we have more of everything. More joy, more love, more humor, more fellowship with one another more respect for others, less crime, and more peace in our lives when God lives within us. And maybe, just maybe, it's the Holy Spirit which brings that peace on earth and goodwill to all men and women. Now, there's one final thing that can be said about wind. It cannot be controlled. It blows where it will, always has, and always will. Wind is a very powerful force. It cannot be stopped or controlled by people. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is not subject to human control. The moving of the Holy Spirit is God at work here and now and everywhere. There is great variety in the wind. It may be a soft whisper, gently rustling the leaves on the trees, or it may be a powerful hurricane or tornado uprooting trees. We never know when or where the Spirit will be, and often it comes when we least expect it. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, a good friend of mine was an associate minister at a large church in New Mexico. The senior pastor told him to visit a very wealthy woman in the hospital who was not an active member but was still on the rolls of the church. Now the senior pastor <clears throat> didn't tell him whether or not there was a problem or why he didn't go see her. And then my friend found out later 
that she was bitterly angry at the senior pastor and that the senior pastor couldn't stand the woman because they had had a fight years ago and neither one of them had ever spoke to the other since. When she came to church, <coughs> which was rarely, she would slip in the side door and leave right before the sermon began if the senior pastor was preaching. He wasn't ever going to go see her at the hospital, <laughs> so he sent his associate. And this young man went to the hospital. And you need to know that this is one of his very first official hospital calls. Been there, done that. And I feel just like he did. He was young, stupid, and felt very awkward. He walked quietly into her dark, very dark private room, and he thought she was sleeping. <clears throat> and as he came to the hospital bed, he accidentally dislodged the side railing, and it slammed down, and it was very loud. So now he was trying very quietly to raise the side railing to its proper position, and as he was doing so, he knocked over the water pitcher and a cup full of apple juice, and they both spilled on the bed and on the woman's nightgown. And while that was happening, he stuck his elbow in her lunch tray, and to top it off, all of her magazines and flower arrangements on the table near her bed crashed to the floor. And in that moment, the whole floor of nurses and doctors came running into her room. Totally, humilita totally humiliated, <laughs> my young friend hastily said a prayer and then rushed out of the room. When he got back to the church, a phone call came from the woman at the hospital. <laughs> he hated to take that call. He knew he was in trouble, really bad trouble. He finally took the call and she said, Young man, you must come back to the hospital to see me. I apologize for not speaking to you but I was trying so hard not to burst out laughing at what you were trying to do with such sincerity that I was too embarrassed to speak. I have not laughed that much for years. You gave me a beautiful and a precious gift. You helped me realize that for the last several years I have been in a prison of my own anger and hate and your sincere prayer touched me in a special way. Thank you. He later said of that incident, the Holy Spirit had found a way to minister to this woman through my ineptness. My friends, the wind blows where it may, and so does the Holy Spirit. And it is blowing into our lives, and it's blowing into this church. And when the Spirit blows into our lives and into our church, it gives us hope and power and joy and grace and love. We're a small church, but that doesn't mean we can't do big things for God. The Spirit of the living God will walk with us and teach us and guide us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake, if we will allow Him to. The Holy Spirit never goes where he's not invited. And if we'll invite him in, he will come. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping together. We ask you to hear our prayers today. And we ask you, God, to send your Holy Spirit. Help us to feel his presence every moment of every day in all of our lives and especially in the life of Mesquite Cumberland Presbyterian Church. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.